Dude. Ooh, a lot of eating. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of eating, yeah. Uh, for me, anyways, I'm just, I still, I'm coming down from like such a high of competing. I'm just trying to take things a little bit slower. So I was just chilling in the room, um, walking around the village, enjoying the scenes, going to eat, um, just going to like do a few shopping for my family, uh, just a few, um, yeah, let's say accessories to bring home. So yeah, it's been quite a chill few days, yeah after competing yet. So how would you sum up your Olympic campaign? Because I, I think when it comes to the Irish public, everybody was rooting for you so badly during the, the week against uh, your opponent from Taipei. You'd almost kind of captured the imagination of the public for your two matches, basically, in that. Was it seen yeah. as a success from your perspective? Yeah, yeah. Um, Performance-wise, yeah. And results-wise, a little bit, no, because I wanted... Of course, I wanted to win that match and, and to get myself through to the knockout stages. But I think I gave my all. Um, I gave literally what all I had from for what I have now in my in my toolbox or in my arsenal. So I gave literally and I fought. And yeah, I have no real regrets. But yeah, to sum up my whole ex- Olympic experience campaign, I think it's an unbelievable experience. I don't think best experience I've experienced so far in my career. So it's just moments like this. I really, I want more moments like this just to spur me on because it's, it's no better feeling really when I'm walking on court. And then, and I know in back of my head that, every, that my, all my family's watching at home and support me and support is crazy. And then even having the staffs here watching me play and just cheering on every single point, my coach is behind the uh, the seat and the coaches in the stand. So it was just surreal, surreal experience. And I will treasure this for my, my yeah, I will treasure this moment for the rest of my career, yeah. Can you talk us through that defeat the other day? Because it was an incredible comeback on your part. I think after the, the first game, a lot of people might have thought, right, this is it. He's yeah. going to get beaten 2-0 here. That's not what happened yeah. whatsoever. You, you came so close. So what are you thinking when you do go 1-0 down and and how strong do you have to be mentally to bring it back? Yeah, I think um, in my head, I, I I had really good physical preparation. So I felt in my head, I always thought, I was just thinking, all right, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. So maybe he got the first set, but I can still win the second set. And and I felt okay. I didn't feel that I was playing bad in the first. I think he was just, he was playing a little bit better than me. So I felt that if I just raised my game, we could be 50-50 and I could win my points better. And I felt I did raise my game in the second set. And I was a little bit lucky in the second set with a few challenges that went my way, which um, that was very helpful. But yeah, I kept, stayed in there, stuck it out and fought. I knew I had, I knew I was fitter than him in some ways, but he was just a lot more experienced and he could, um, let's say, had more power, a lot more power as well that he could win a points easier. But I felt if the long, rallies were longer, I had a better chance. So. In the third set, it was 50-50 until 11 all. And I think he raised his game. And I really think that's the difference between players top 10 and the players like me and myself, where I'm at now, top 50 in the world. So, yeah, they can raise their game at crucial times, which I didn't really handle it well at that moment of time. But it's something to learn from. And I'm really happy that um, I got into that situation. And, yeah, I, was, I, I couldn't sleep that night. So I was just like, what if, what if, but... At the end of the day, it happened, and I'm kind of glad it happened. So I learned a lot from that match, yeah. yeah. I can imagine. You mentioned power there. You're, you were obviously one of the youngest competitors in the men's draw yeah. in badminton this year. So is that something that you feel is just going to be a natural development of your game over the next three years? Yeah, I wouldn't say natural. Of course, I, I think I have to focus on that area sure. to, be, to get better in it. Um, but yeah, I feel... Time is on my side and I feel um, everything is clicking in the past couple of months or so. I really feel that my time will, will really come soon um, to break into the world stage, break in top 20, break top 25. I think when I do that, I will, yeah, I will, I think I will get better sponsorships from Bampton, uh, my equipment uh, sponsors. So it's, it's a lot. Um, I had a lot riding on that match. I feel if I made a good result in the even better result in Olympics I could yeah maybe just fund myself more and have a little bit 
better life, but I have no regrets. And yeah, I loved every moment of it. And yeah, is that's that, it really, yeah. <laughs> is, that, is, that a, is that a big element, Nat, then trying to actually get funding, trying to have the right equipment? Can, can that be a struggle at times? Yeah, as a Bampton um, athlete, I don't think Bampton is the highest paid sport in the world. Um, so, yeah, at the moment, I, at the moment, I'm very lucky and grateful to be funded by Sport Ireland and Bampton Ireland helped me out a lot. But again, like, um, rent is not cheap in Dublin, as you know. Uh, and then I, I had a couple of sparring partners over from Malaysia, so I had to pay one of them. I had to fund that myself. So it's, it's not. Um, it's tough, yeah, of course it's tough, but uh, I think at the moment um, I am getting by. So, of course, in the future, I would be looking to make better results to, yeah, let's just make my life a little bit easier, yeah. But I'm doing it for the love of the sport and, yeah, I wouldn't have it any other way, so, yeah. What, one of the big storylines that emerged from during the week as well, Nat, is your relationship with Stephen Cluxton. You were in the same school as him, <laughs> St. David's yeah. in our team. The first question I have for you is, Give us your expert view and be as ruthless as you want to be here. How good or otherwise is Stephen Cluxton at badminton? <laughs> I played Stephen... I played uh, Sir. I would call him Sir. <laughs> I played Sir in... in we had a few, like, badminton training. I, I kind of... Yeah, he asked me to come just to teach, just help out a few things. So I actually... He was a lot better than I thought, <laughs> so <laughs> so I have to give that to Sir. So he was, yeah, lefty as well, so a very tricky player. And yeah, a lot better than I expected. So I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> did, did he teach you as well or did he just work together on the badminton team? Uh, yeah, yeah, he was my maths teacher in third year and my physics teacher in fifth and sixth year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good teacher? Yeah. Um, uh, very like strict <laughs> as normal teacher, but he's very strict with taking notes and everything. But I think his, some of his notes were, were quite good. Yeah. Um, had very good ideas and philosophy in class. So, which was, yeah. So looking back, yeah. Good teacher. Yeah. What has the reaction been like, I guess, e even from your own family's perspective I know that your parents restaurant in, in Clare Hall got a, a good bit of publicity after your yeah. after your win against the Sri Lankan opponent because you mentioned them uh, yeah. how, how have they found things at home knowing that their son and uh, and their relative is is achieving such great things in Tokyo yeah I think my parents are embracing it <laughs> <laughs> um, my mom and dad are just telling me that everyone's going into Chinese and saying oh congrats to this so I think they're embracing it and I'm when they told me that, I'm, I was kind of glad because they deserve all the credit they they get and all the praises they get. So of all the hard work and all the struggles they've gone through for me and my sister and our family. So I think my parents deserve all the credit and all the praises. Yeah, exactly. That's coming to them now. And I, re yeah, I kind of, I just can't wait to go home and celebrate and just enjoy life for like a week <laughs> and then we're back we're back a week and then we're back on um and then we're back training and then i have an event coming up in korea at the end of august so yeah a week of rest relax enjoy time with my family my friends uh and then i look yeah and then maybe a little staycation maybe i haven't decided yet but yeah just a week enjoy and then we're back at it i think it was a great experience but for me um it was more important for me to be all the events coming after Olympics because I feel I'm still young and this is where I can hit my stride and yeah, just take this experience and move on, move on and yeah, and push forward. Yeah. Are your parents going to have you at the back of the restaurant chopping veg when you come home? <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> I hope not because if it's really busy, I don't mind doing it, but I hope not. I just, <laughs> um, but we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully those days those days are gone. Like it's it's been really interesting, <laughs> Nat, because of the fact that you've had to wait an extra year 
for these games, which probably benefited you given yeah. your age profile. And, yeah. and there's a number of people that we've spoken to over the last couple of days, like Mona McSharry in the swimming pool, yeah. the, the, the women's four that got the bronze medal. They really benefited from having an extra year. And then the yeah. bonus is that everybody's talking about Paris now and it'll really seem like um, a really short turnaround, I guess, before that. I, I guess you're, you're fully embracing the fact that, that Paris is only three years away and, you, and you're not afraid to actually focus on that right now. Yeah, yeah, I think um, it's good to look at the bigger picture. Um, for badminton anyways, I think the Olympic qualification is actually a two-year process. So literally 2022, which is like five, six months time, um, or less or less than that time, that's when literally my Olympic qualification for Paris will basically start. So right. it's a two-year process and yeah, it's coming fast. Like, it's coming fast. Uh, life is coming a little bit fast at me now. So, <laughs> um, but I'm, yeah, I am embracing it. I am giving my all in practice. I would give my all in practice, would even practice harder, smarter. I would find ways to improve. Um, so I will give it socks for the next one, two, three, three Olympics if I want to, because I really feel that I'm hitting my stride now and I'm competing with the best in the world. So that's a good sign. But now I want to beat the best players in the world. So I think that's the next step. And I'm confident, yeah, about the future, yeah. Yeah. Well, Nat, I think you've got a, a few million new fans as a result of the last couple of weeks. <laughs> uh, we've all really enjoyed watching you perform in Tokyo and congratulations on your success so far. No doubt there is much more from you to come. Thanks a million for taking the call, Nat. Perfect. Thank you for having me, guys. Thank Cheers. You. Cheers. Nat went there on the line. He uh, was competing in Tokyo, obviously, in badminton. I'm sure you were watching him. He beat a Sri Lankan opponent and lost to a Taipei opponent midweek. And what was a cracker of a game, to be honest with you? If he had won that, I think uh, we would have gone haywire on badminton for a couple of days because it was an absolute cracker of a game. I can tell you, though, sticking with the Olympics for a moment, that the Irish women's hockey team are out. They have been beaten on a 2-0 scoreline by Great Britain. Right, let's cross over to Parky Cueve because at halftime... Taggy Fogarty, you are witnessing an absolute cracker by the looks of things. Oh, and it's absolutely savage down here. It's a frantic game of hurling. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to witness uh, what's going on in front of me here. Waterford got off to a blistering start and went four up just after four minutes. Uh, Jamie Barron flying it uh, at midfield, scoring three pints. Uh, the first pint of the, of, of the game came from Parchy Curran after a minute and a half and Waterford flew out of the ranks. But Tipperary handed to Tipperary. Uh, they came back into it. Goals from Shamey Callaghan in the fifth and sixth minute. Um, long balls to the square, Owen, and we talked about Tipperary targeting Waterford and targeting that full, full back line of Ian Kenny, Connor Prunty and Shane McNulty. Well, two long balls came down to Shamey Callaghan and they absolutely stitched them into the back of the net. Connor Prunty was probably caught ball watching slightly for one of them but he absolutely stitched it and there was nothing absolutely nothing Sean O'Brien could do but that kind of tip, kept Tipperary in the game Waterford were uh, having the upper hand uh, but them two goals really put Tipperary back flying it uh, and it was tit for tat um, Peter Hogan got a point from play Jack Fagan came into it got two points uh, Desi Hutchison uh, got two points and then uh, Austin Gleeson on the 10th minute it was all goals in the first uh, on the first 10 minutes Desi or Austin Gleeson uh, got uh, in the 10th minute uh, right from the ball to the back of the net and what they're doing on oh, they're running at Tipperary as we suspected and Jamie could have put that ball over the bar but he went to it put it through the lanes fell to Austin Gleeson and he didn't even look at the goals just struck it off his right hand side and buried it to the top corner of the net brilliant goal and that gave life into the legs again into Waterford in the 21st minute Desi Hunchson struck it on the ground for their second goal of the game for Waterford uh, once again it was played through the lanes and they could have tapped it over the bar but they didn't they stayed running Jack Pernicast tore down the middle and it fell to Desi Hutchinson uh, who's been man marked by Cottle Barrett and he's buried it to the back of the net that's 1-2 from Desi Hutchinson but Cottle Barrett playing a very good game as well but there's nothing to do when Desi Hutchinson looks for the ball and gets that quality type of ball uh, there's not, absolutely nothing you can do um, so at the, the first quarter Tipperary were 2-6 and Waterford were, nine, were 1-9 it was actually a draw game but Waterford had done much more to hurl than I felt Tipperary just because of Waterford's mistakes overplayed it slightly uh, Tipperary tacked on a few scores um, from Bubbles or wire. you know Bubbles really keeping Tipperary in the game when uh, Waterford running at him he's got four points from play you know he looks like he's doing nothing but he's just roaming in roaming out Jamie Callan has gone to full forward and actually since the two goals on the long ball to the square has not been working for Tipperary 
you know, Conor Prunty has got the better of Shane McCallan in the last 15 minutes. Shane McNulty has got the better of Jake Morris as well. And Bubbles O'Dwyer is just roaming out. So the tactic worked in the first 10 minutes. They got two goals, but Watford had uh, tightened up ship, and that is not working anymore. Watford, on the other hand, their running game is working when they get it, but Tip are stifling it. They are stopping it as source, and when they do that, Tip are picking up the brakes and putting it over the bar. Uh, in fairness to them. Half-time score here, uh, 35 minutes gone. Four, uh, Waterford, 2-14. Tibber Darn, just 2-13. Just a point between the teams. It's a, it's a, it sounds amazing, Taggy. Like, so so we, would you say that the, the old reliables have really stepped up for Tipperary today? I think from what you said there, that the answer to that question is very much yes. Yeah, absolutely. Like Seamus Callaghan, two goals uh, from play. John O'Dwyer, four points from play. Jason Ford, three points from play, three from freeze. Michael Breen, a point, and Ronan Maher from wing back, two points uh, fr- from play as well. So, in fairness, the, for Tipperary, Seamus Callaghan, the first 15 minutes, 15 minutes is dangerous. Now, Conor Prunty has got a better. Dan McCormick is marking Jamie Barron. Jamie Barron was lightning in the first 15, 20 minutes, scoring three points from play. And as I said, Carl Barrett is picking up Desi Hutchinson. But when Desi gets the ball, he is very dangerous so Tipperary are stifling them at the back when they dispossess them um, up the field they're scoring from long range but when Watford get their running game going they are dangerous Jack Fagan coming into the game with two points as well uh, from play uh, Austin Gleeson a superb sideline cut uh, in the 13th minute stuck it over the bar he's on the scoreboard he has uh, won two from play as well so the big names are stepping up today on as far as I can see you would you fear for Tipperary in the second half after what happened against Limerick? Like again, the, the, I suppose the counterpoint to that is what happened to Waterford last Saturday. Um, to be honest, I wouldn't. I right. think it's championship on. I think it's knockout. I think Liam Sheedy and I think Tipperary have enough experience to realise that this is going to go down to the wire and uh, Watford are going to try this running game, as I said already, off the shoulder, but Tipperary are holding tight. But I do feel that Watford have done a lot more of the hurling and it's more their mistakes allowing Tipperary to keep in the game. As I said, only for bubbles of the wire, for the four points that he tacked on, Tipperary could have been three or four down rather, that, rather than one. Taggy Fogarty, great stuff and by the sounds of it, just an absolute cracker of a game. It is Tipperary 2-13, Waterford 2-14. That's the half-time scoreline from Parky Cueve. So an absolute cracker of a second half in store there. Remember, Dublin against Cork throws in at 7 o'clock this evening and then it is Ulster football final day in Croke Park. 4 o'clock is the throw-in time from Monaghan against Tyrone. Ireland are out of the Olympics in hockey. They've been beaten 2-0 by Great Britain. We will be reacting to that with David Fitzgerald next. The Olympic show on OTB Sports with Indeed, proud partner of Team Ireland. On Friday, October 15th, people all over Ireland will be sleeping out to help shine a light on homelessness and raise vital funds for Focus Ireland. And this weekend on News Talk, together with Focus Ireland and Board Gosh Energy, we're encouraging you to join them. We're asking business leaders, corporates and people across the country to give just one night to sleep out and raise funds for vital homelessness services. If you're a business leader, you can join one of the socially distanced events in Dublin or Cork, or you can host your own event in your workplace or home. You can give one night to help change a life. Register now at newstalk.com forward slash Focus Ireland. Afternoons are easy with insuremyvan.ie, Ireland's low-cost van insurance specialist. Get your business back on the road with insuremyvan's best price guarantee. For super savings, visit insuremyvan.ie. City Financial Marketing Group Limited training as insuremyvan.ie is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. Sean, what's that thing going round the garden? That is my, uh, our new Husqvarna auto mower. Auto mower? Yeah, it's a robotic lawnmower from Husqvarna. Cuts the grass automatically, has GPS tracking and an app. Even works in the rain. Hmm. I just thought, why spend time cutting grass when I could spend it with the family? Great! You can put the dinner on, so... Ah, no can do, love. I have to paint the man cave. Husqvarna auto mower. Never mow again. Learn more at husqvarna.ie. At Tesco, we've got value with summer in mind. Go all out with Tesco Quarter Pounder Beef Burgers 4-Pack or Tesco Fire Pit Peri Peri Chicken Sizzle Steaks and more, any three for €10. Euro. And don't forget the salad. With offers on Tesco Cherry Tomatoes 250 gram and Little Gem Lettuce Twin Pack, both only 49 cent each. Or stock up on O'Donnell's Cheddar and Onion Crisps 125 gram or Maltesers 102 gram and more, five for only €5. Euro. Tesco, every little helps. Here's the long and the short of it. 
18 months ago, a delicious ripe apple was taken from a tree in Clonmel. That apple had but one purpose in life, to be part of the most refreshing pint of cider that you ever imagined. And now is that apple's moment. So go find that apple, wherever it may be. Its whole life has been leading to this glorious, long weekend. Bulmer's Original Cider. When time bears fruit. Enjoy Bulmer's responsibly. Visit bulmers.ie. Ireland is moving cautiously through our recovery plan. The Delta variant continues to be a risk. But by working together to stick to the basics, we can help to slow its spread. Choose outdoors, even if an indoor option is available. If inside, make sure it is well ventilated and avoid crowded spaces. And let's all keep hand washing, wearing our face coverings and keeping our distance, even outdoors. Thanks to the support of the Irish people, our vaccination programme continues to make great progress. And now, anyone aged 16 and over can register for a vaccine. The Economic Recovery Plan is helping people get back to work and supporting businesses. So let's protect this progress. For full details, go to gov.ie forward slash recovery. Supported by the Government of Ireland. What's the difference between those who go far and those who go all the way? Or between training at home and representing your homeland with the world's eyes upon you? The difference is care. It's what makes the strong unstoppable. That's why Team Ireland trusts Let's Get Checked as they compete in Tokyo, supporting them with health testing and telehealth services. Caring for the pride of Ireland as they make Ireland proud. Let's get checked. Proud partner of Team Ireland. At Harvey Norman, we've got big deals in store and online this bank holiday weekend. See the massive 280 euro on the HP X360 convertible laptop with powerful AMD Ryzen processor. Now 919. Or save 20 euro on the TicWatch GTX smartwatch. Packed full of features to help you reach your fitness goals. Now only 79 euro. And we're matching all competitors' prices, even their sale prices. But hurry, these big deals are for a limited time only. Harvey Norman, your technology specialists. Go! Your phone rings. Who could it be? It's just Gary. Only it's not just Gary, is it? Huh? It's your bestie. And he's ready to collect you for the road trip of a lifetime. Seven days camping out under the stars, toasting s'mores by a roaring fire, kumbayaing to your heart's content, with every animal in the forest singing along in perfect harmony. Gary, freedom is calling. Get your guitar. Virgin Mobile. Bring on amazing. T's and C's apply. See virginmobile.ie. ESB, with the help of the Climate Action Fund, has been making significant improvements to the electric vehicle public charging network to ensure the journey to an all-electric future together is brighter and faster than ever. So far, we've upgraded over 590 of our charge points, and we've added faster charges across the country. So now you can charge and go in less time than before. With over 1,350 charge points in the island of Ireland, you'll never be far from one of our chargers. And you can be confident that our network will be there for you when you need it. Visit esb.ie forward slash ecars to find out more. The Olympic Show on OTB Sports with Indeed, proud partner of Team Ireland. Okay, I am delighted to say we have got a couple of bronze medalists with us. You've probably been up quite early from Wednesday morning. You've probably been up early every single morning this week, and it started with that incredible run back in Wednesday morning. It feels like weeks ago at this point, as we watched that for Kyo, Emer Lamb, Fiona Murta, and Emily Hegarty get over the line in the women's four. They are officially bronze medalists, and half of that team, Afra Kyo and Emer Lamb, are with us. Has that got old yet, the title of Olympic bronze medalists? I'd yeah. say not. No, it hasn't sunk yeah. in really at all. It's all been kind of go, go, go since the last, since the race. So I don't think we've really had a moment to kind of sit down and process it and kind of actually think about like, what it means. What was your initial feeling immediately in the aftermath? Let's start with you on this question, Afric, because I, I assume that there, there are a number of different things going on in terms of have you got the medal? Who do I call first? Where do I go? What, what was in your head immediately once you crossed the line? Um, well, I think initially it was probably a bit of relief because we obviously, as everyone saw, didn't have the best start and it was kind of looking for a while that we may not actually get a medal. So I think, yeah, it was just a sense of relief. And then I suppose when we started, you know, 
getting changed to onto the podium like these are things that we were almost put into the back of our mind all week we didn't want to think that far ahead and yeah like that was a really nice moment you know the whole team was there watching us and um then when we we rode the boat back and got our phones i think we, most of us just rang home straight away and it was i think you know four or five a.m at that stage at home but they were all still up um so yeah it was nice just to get in touch with them and you know see all the excitement from their side Emer, was the target to win a medal? Was that very much your, your singular goal before flying out? Um, I think in the back of our minds, we all kind of had the idea that we were capable of it. But obviously, when you get to the Olympics, it's such a different ball game. Like, there's obviously more pressure than there would probably be at, like, a World Championships because it's such a bigger platform. Like, there's so many more people around the world and watching it. And, like, people I haven't spoken to in years and years are messaging me good luck and following the races. Um, so, you know, anything can happen in a race like that. Like everyone peaks for the Olympics. There's no like, everyone has their preparations done four years, five years of training this time. So you really aren't sure what's going to happen. But we knew it was something we were capable of. And if everything went right and we were able to perform to our best, we knew we were hopeful. Like. And I think that there was this growing sense over the first few days of the Olympic Games, a growing familiarity, I think, between the nation and the four of you. And I think that morning when you pushed the Australians close, everybody was like, oh, hold on a minute. There's, there's a real, real chance of a medal here. Did, did, did that feel, was that the reality for you guys when, 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 you were, when you were sitting there after that race? Oh yeah, because the other heat had the Dutch and the Chinese get mm. through, but we had already raced them this season. So uh, we were actually quite happy that we got drawn the Australians, even though they were the favorites. Um, we saw it kind of as like a free hit of them, essentially, um, to kind of test our speed against them. And then when we saw that we were so close to them, I think it gave us a good bit of confidence going into the final. So, so talk us through that final then. Is it literally just a case of keeping your eye on Great Britain for those closing stretches or, or do you not even get into that? I suppose going into it, we kind of tried to keep our own focus and focus on just mm. our speed and doing the 2K as fast as we could, relevant to what everyone else was doing. We knew that the other crews were going to try and push away from us as much as they could in the first 1K, which they did. Um, so we were a bit disappointed and a bit kind of shook off our start, basically, when everyone seemed to like jump away from us. Because um, we were aiming to stay kind of close to the pack. But luckily, we were still in touch with GB, and they were right beside us. So the whole way through the race, we knew in the back of our heads that we can beat them, like we've beaten them before. So I think that gave us a bit of confidence then to the second 1K, just push on and go as early as possible to try and get through them and get the medal. Talk to us about your household and how important that was from your perspective, even just over the last couple of years and those levels that you set for yourself. I think like growing up, obviously, I didn't think it was like any different than a normal household. I thought we were all just like, well, we are just like normal people. My sister's just quite, I have three older sisters and they're all quite sporty. And obviously a house of four girls, there is going to be a bit of competition going on. But um, I think now that I'm here and stuff, and I take a step back, I can actually really appreciate it that, like, I was quite lucky to have that high school in that environment coming up. Like, seeing Claire obviously go to Rio, I remember just thinking, oh, my God, she's, like, a normal person, and she's at the Olympics, and normal people can do that too, you know? Whereas before, I think I always looked at, like, Usain Bolt, and, like, there were a lot of big Olympian superstars and thought, like, oh, you have to be, like, these incredible people that have, like, massive backgrounds and have been, like, doing breathing and eating their sports since like the day they were born. Whereas when I saw Claire and, and she like was able to balance rowing and studying and all sorts and make to the Olympics and be as successful as she was, I was like, God, like if she can do it, I can do it, you know? <laughs> so That's yeah, no, it definitely made a big difference to me. Gave me a bit of belief. That, that, and just having a role model, I guess, it just underlines how important that is. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's so easy to like look at athletes and stuff and think they're these superhuman people or Mm. that I have super strength and super speed and that's why they're there but they're not like they're just more people who went to school and picked up a sport and just happened to fall in love with it and we're lucky enough to find that kind of passion and carry it through. Africa, from your perspective you're from the Furbick in Connemara right? Yeah. What, what, what was your rowing background like and, and how vibrant a community was there growing up because we, we've heard a lot about Skibbereen over the last five years it's fair to say I'm, I'm interested in, in your backgrounds. Um, so I started rowing when I went to secondary school, um, the Jez, and it's actually quite rare, rare for a school to have a rowing club. Um, but in Galway, the Jez and then the Bish, a boys' school up the road, also have a rowing club. 
so even on the carb where I trained, there's like four or five clubs um, based on the carb. And, you know, obviously it gets quite competitive between all the local clubs. And even Fiona, um, she came from GRC too. So we were rowing around the same time uh, in separate clubs. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, rowing Galway was just like, there were so many people doing it. It was, it was such a great community. And I think you kind of spent maybe 75% of the year almost hating each other and trying to be faster than each other. And then, you know, come the summer when all the races are on and eventually it all finishes off. Like everyone just kind of hangs out and celebrates together. And it's just, yeah, it's a great community. I guess those standards wouldn't be reached unless there was that true rivalry at club level and at community level, right? Yeah, definitely. And besides myself and Fiona, you know, there's been other Olympians. Cormac Follin went to the Jazz and he also went to the Beijing Olympics. And there's been so many other under-23s and junior athletes who've gone on to world championships from Galway too. So I think it's just about, um, like Emer said, just seeing, you know, people you, who you can actually relate to um, achieving those, um, like going to the world championships and you can see it's achievable. Uh, so yeah, no, it is great just to see the, all the talent in Galway. Do you guys remember when your boat was put together? Do you, do you think that, uh, there, do you recall when you thought that this was actually going to be something that would take you places? Because obviously this is something that Rowing Ireland centrally have, have put together, the, the, the four of you in the boat. Got put together after trials. We still had obviously to qualify. So, you know, we're always working to get faster and faster with the hope to obviously qualify. And we almost didn't really think past qualification for the first kind of six or seven weeks of training. And then when we qualified, it was a case of, okay, I think it was like 60 days or something uh, until the Olympics. So we almost didn't even have time to think about what was possible. It was just about getting back to training and, you know, trying to get as fast as we could in the limited time that we had. So would you say, Emir, then, that it was a, a great positive that we're talking about Tokyo in 2021 rather than 2020? Us, yeah, I think the extra year, extra year is definitely a benefit for us. Like we're quite a young crew, and I think the extra year just to get a bit fitter and develop a bit more like technically as well definitely stood to us. Yeah, I think we were one of the few people that were a bit lucky with the pandemic. I, I, it's sort of beyond, beyond luck, anyway. It's it's uh, it's far well within your own control. I think it's more what you did rather than any sort of fortune. And I, I think this is something we've actually been speaking about with a couple of people over the last little while, like with Mona McSharry in the pool, how she's benefited from the extra year. But again, you have to take the opportunity. It's not just fortune uh, for, for the people. But it kind of brings us on to the very exciting prospect of this Olympic cycle only being three years. And I know it's probably the last thing from your mind at the moment. But at the same time, has it come into your mind even just a little bit over the last couple of days? It definitely has. Like, it's hard to be here in this kind of environment and the buzz of it. And, like, this is what we've been working for for guts of five years or from when we're, I suppose you can even say from when we we're about 12 years old. Um, so when you're here and you're actually experiencing it, like, you obviously don't want it to end. And the idea of doing it again, you're like, no problem. Because obviously you've got the hard work and the winter months and all that kind of thing. So sitting here now, it's, yeah, it's very easy to say, definitely, let's go do it. But I think we're going to probably have to take a few weeks off and sit back and process it and kind of see how life kind of pans out over the next while and figure it out. Afrikio and Emer Lam speaking to me a little bit earlier on. They were half of Ireland's bronze medal winning four team earlier on this week on Wednesday morning. I can tell you it is 2.14 to 2.18. Waterford in the lead after 44 minutes at Parky Cueve. You are watching the Olympic show on OTB Sports with Indeed, proud partner of Team Ireland. We are live every day across the Olympics, across all of our social channels. It's all with thanks to Indeed, who are proud to support Team Ireland at the Tokyo 2020 Games. Indeed believes the world works better when people are given every opportunity to unleash their true talents. The hashtag is Talent Unleashed. Now, next up on the Olympic show, I'm delighted to say we are joined by David Fitzgerald, Irish Hockey International, to reflect on today's unfortunate Olympic exit at the hand of Great Britain. David, how are you getting on? Yeah, not too bad. Obviously a little disappointed after that game there. How did they play? Uh, yeah, I suppose it's, if you look at its result and performance are two different things, but in a performance, it was a much better performance than, say, the India game. Um, traditionally at times, say, we've we've relied heavily on defence. We've relied massively on Aisha McFarren to come up with 10, 15 saves a game to come into these crucial games. That wasn't the case in this game. I think we possibly didn't keep the ball well enough, didn't create enough chances, but in terms of performance... It was a much better performance, but unfortunately, 
that doesn't mean you stay in a big tournament. Are those the same sort of issues in terms of keeping the ball that we've seen all tournament or is this specific to just this game? I think you could look at it probably would be all tournament. It is a different environment out there, the heat and the humidity. Uh, when we've been ourselves to those sort of big tournaments, you're playing in heat. You're trying to eliminate basic errors is the hardest thing. And if you look at, say, some of the bigger nations to ourselves, we're playing those top five, six in the world. Our ability to keep the ball compared to them just isn't quite there yet. So when we look at the campaign overall, I guess today is not necessarily where the disappointment lies. There were disappointments earlier on in the group stages, a couple of days ago, obviously, against India, which, which, which are, is the reason why, why they're out at this juncture. Yeah, 100%. I think, you know, if you look at the group, you have Germany and Holland there. The, I think they're one and two or one and three in the world. GB are the reigning Olympic champions. I know people are saying GB are probably not the team they were but they have multiple gold medalists in it. So you're always targeting games. Got off to a fantastic start beating South Africa. The next game to target would have been India. We, we beat India or get a draw against India. We're into the knockout stages. Uh, it, it's the mad thing about the Olympics. You have five games in seven, eight days. You're always going to have a bad game. And unfortunately, that bad game for us came against India where we didn't quite perform. I think the girls did really well in that game, even though they didn't perform to the, to the best of their ability. They grind it out for 57 minutes and they'll look back and be good at on that goal in the last three minutes that, in reality, if you look at it, that was the one that knocked them out of the Olympics. We were speaking to the rowers just there who won bronze earlier on and even Nat Wen, the badminton player, kind of referring to the fact that it, it was a great opportunity to have these Olympic Games in 2021. Was it kind of the opposite way for the hockey team? Um, I think you look both sides of a one. I think if you're talking to them, it gave them a year to be in a full-time, more full-time professional system. Mm. Um, they had a lot of time with the coaching staff. So you could look at it that way and say it was an advantage for a year later. But the other side of it is our own national league in Ireland with the restrictions and obviously the global pandemic, it didn't happen. So game time was much, much less compared to say other countries on the continent in Europe where their leagues would continue. So I think that side of it was a big disadvantage. Where do you see the graph of this team going over the next little while? Yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting question. Uh, you would hope when you look at the age profile of the team, it's an extremely young team, an extremely talented team. Um, there will be a couple of players after every cycle. You know, this is the end of their journey. And it's a really, it's a really tough time, and especially it being a, after an Olympic Games, you know. But most of the team is young. They have a lot of years ahead. But again, it probably comes down to, you know, funding where in life those players want to be jobs careers start to come into you'd hope the guts of the team will stay together if they can stay together hopefully qualifying for world cups olympics that becomes the norm and if we look at it this is their first olympics it's a new environment once you it's like anything in life once you do it a couple of times as a team it becomes far easier so my hope is that team will grow and these things become the norm and suddenly in big tournaments like an olympic games uh, they did so well in the world cup getting their world cup final that these just things keep happening You've kind of touched on the style of play that Ireland brought into this game. Are you expecting a change in that at all over the next little while? Is there development in terms of the, the product that they're actually producing on the field? Yeah, I think I think they have developed in the last mm. two years as well. Uh, oh, sorry, three years since the World Cup. Um, the amazing World Cup, you know, got to a World Cup final, brought, brought hockey to the nation. A very dogged, determined a defensive style they've definitely improved massively in their attack and style of play i think that's where they look to keep improving um if you looked at say the midfield today in a once-off game you have to win i think gb did their homework chloe Watkins makes that midfield tick uh a lot of ball goes through her and you can see roshi and elaine a try play through gb definitely had their eye on her and we'll probably try to develop more options to get the ball further up the pitch and not rely so heavily on chloe in the midfield so you mentioned uh, Chloe Watkins there. I just also wanted to mention Aisha McFerrin, who you've already touched on. Like, I mean, I, I guess against the Dutch, there was probably a sense that it could have been a hell of a lot worse if she wasn't in there. And she's obviously somebody that we've become very familiar with over the last couple of years. Uh, outside of her, who, who are the, the, the truly world-class players in this team or, or, or players that you can almost build a team around, I guess, over the next couple of years? Yeah, I, I think honestly, and obviously myself being Irish, people say it's biased, but there is a number of world-class players. I think if you look at that centre-back pairing, of Roisin Upton and Lena Tice. Their age, again, means you know they can do another cycle, definitely, and you can build a team around them. Uh, you have the likes of Zoe Wilson, who missed his Olympics, to come back in after an ACL injury. And then you've got some young players, the likes of Sarah Torrens up front. Um, 
again, I think she's only in her early 20s. So they'd be the players there. So we can really build a team around these players for the next four, eight years. Lastly, then, what, what's your confidence level uh, for Paris? Are we going to have a, a men and a women's team, do you reckon? Uh, I'd, be, I'd be quite confident going into Paris. You know, I think the men's team was very unfortunate to miss out in this one. And that has to be the goal for you know, Irish hockey. We're trying to get, we've got one team to Rio. We've got one team to Tokyo. Can we get both teams going together? Can we, first of all, can we get both teams qualified for the World Cup? which is the most important thing. And those things, those qualifiers happen in October. So that's the first goal. Once that starts to happen, Olympic qualification comes more naturally. Brilliant. It sounds like things are relatively positive from your standpoint. Yeah, definitely. I think uh, right now for the girls, I remember it after Rio, it's extremely tough time. There's uh, regret, there's disappointment. There's, there's a lot of things running through your mind. It'll take a little bit of time, but uh, the girls will look back and, and see what they've achieved, qualifying Olympics, competing in the Olympics. It was unfortunate, maybe that one, you'll always have a bad game in the Olympics or any tournament that just happened to be India. But what they've done, they've brought hockey to the forefront. Uh, they've made it a more public sport. And I think they'll look back and the, the whole nation in terms of hockey is proud of them and they should be really proud of their achievement. David, great stuff. Thanks a million for hopping on this afternoon. Thanks a million. Have a good day. Cheers. David Fitzgerald there, Ireland Hockey International, reacting to Ireland's defeat to Great Britain. It finished 2-0 earlier on, so they crash out of the Olympic Games in the group stages. After 52 minutes at, at Parky Cueve, it is Tipperary 2-16, Waterford 3-20 at this point. So a seven-point lead for Waterford at the moment with 18 minutes of normal time to play. It has been an absolute cracker, but Waterford now really putting distance between the sides as a beautiful sideline cut from Austin Gleeson goes over the bar there to make it an eight-point game. Right, so you might have seen during the week that there was a bronze medal for Alice Kinsella as part of the bronze medal winning team in team gymnastics for Great Britain. It was Team GB's first women's team gymnastics medal since 1928. And Alice, I'm not sure if you're all familiar with this, but she's actually the daughter of former Republic of Ireland footballer Mark Kinsella. And I'm delighted to welcome Mark to the show. Mark, how are you getting on? How are you doing? Yes, very good. And to come down there now. You must be a bloody proud father this week. Absolutely. Um, you know, you watch the home and you, you think, um, will he get there? Will he, you know, just miss out? Uh, but the performance on, on Tuesday, it was, uh, it was hair standing up. So, uh, absolutely proud of it. all the four. Very young, inexperienced team, I suppose, going into the Olympics. Um, did they take a gamble after the, the thought before the Olympics with, the, with these four young girls? And uh, it ended up that they picked the right four to win a, a team medal. Could you explain that a little bit to us? So Alice wasn't guaranteed her place for the team, basically, was it? Um, no, it started out like a year ago would have been a problem. Um, so COVID came along, everything was cancelled, and I think you have to sort of retrial again um, as the year went on. So just a month leading up to it, before they named the team, uh, there was a few things she started to get trolled a little bit on, on Twitter uh, about not being good enough, um, shouldn't be in the team, and certain individuals should have been there with more experience. Um, it made the local, it made our club then ask the British Federation then to, to put the scores out there to prove everybody to Alice had the points over the year to make the team. Um, so that was all done. And so she's gone into it a little bit um, uncomfortable, I'd say. Um, a lot of things going against her. Uh, but she seemed to come over it. And once she got to lockdown in the middle of shop for 10 days, and then over there for 10 days, she started to get a, a sports one head on. And uh, don't get a lot of plan was and ended up with the with the medal. How early in Alice's life did you realise that she was a gymnastics prodigy? Um, well, she started off about three or four, as you as you would do. Um, she was spotted by a coach, and uh, we took her with her eldest daughter, and um, they saw something in her that, that coaches do at, at, at whatever sport they're involved in, and they asked her what she would be mind taking her up two two days a week or whatever at that age, and then. Gradually, it went from two to five nights a week, and now the last eight or nine years, she's been full time, really six days a week after school, straight there. No, no real social life uh, the kid had. So it was something I think we spotted at 13, 14, and we were told, listen, she has a chance. Um, can we up the hours? Can we extend the training? Can we make it a little bit more difficult? Um, and I suppose 13, 14 years of age, she started to zone in on, on what she wanted to do, and that was her dream. Uh, the Olympics. Um, she wanted to compete. She wanted to represent her country, and then um, you know she got to do all that. How much input does she then have at that age when she's being told, and you're being told that if you fully commit to this thing, there could be a national spot in the team? Is, is, is there 
is there any blowback from that at all? Because it's obviously a very hard time in everybody's life and fully committing to something at the age of 13 mm. or 14 is quite, is quite the task. Well, it, 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 even for the, for the um, say, the Olympics, there's, there's four competitions and all your marks are, are then evaluated towards to making the Olympic team. So every competition they went into, even at 19, 20 years of age, was the same as going in for the club team, trying to get the qualifications to make the, the Great Britain or Britain team. So every time it was, uh, it was always nerve-wracking for us. Um, you know, I, I find them absolutely amazing, the gymnasts. They're, they're mentally strong athletes. You know, that, that beam is four or five inches wide. And, you know, Joe Public will probably hardly stand on it, never mind have to do mm. the triple whatever they do <laughs> on it and it's make high scores. And, you know, she's gone into a competition where because of the COVID, she had to go there on her own. Her coach wasn't allowed to travel with her because of certain amount of people could travel. So she went there on her own. She was using the twins, coaches, while she was over there. So she sort of had to, had to knuckle down really and, and, and prepare probably harder than most. Um, to get where she was in the, the last three or four weeks. Um, you know, I've got forced to speak to her a couple of times. She's a bit like, still like myself. Um, she didn't have a great qualifying qualify, qualify round, um, so she was a little bit down. There was tears. Um, the coach got hold of her. The other coach, who was uh, Christine Steele, who does the commentating, they got hold of her and um, sort of tried to calm her down. You know, they, they ended up qualifying for the team, so she had another crack at it. Um, spoke to her and then... We did Tuesday morning before she went over for the for the finals, and she had she seemed to have her head right. She just wanted to prove to people that she she was good enough, and it was a hiccup in, on the, the previous Thursday. And she went through, like she said in other interviews, you know, she smashed it. She had a PB on on bars. She went through beam without falling, and she ended up I think fifth overall on the final day as an individual. And um, but like when I spoke to her then, she just wished it was on the Thursday, and then she. In a, a couple of finals, then on the, the, the individual finals, but it wasn't the big, and she ended up coming out of it um, with a medal. And I can tell you, it was for all four of them. Uh, it was it's, it's a long, a long haul, you know, five years. Mm. Yeah. Having for the Olympics to get to get there. Yeah, it's a it's a phenomenal story, and our biggest congratulations to you, Mark. It's uh, it's brilliant. So uh, I hope. I hope you've enjoyed the celebrations and uh, I hope you enjoy the celebrations when she's home as well. Thanks a million. Uh, absolutely, no problem. Thank you. Cheers. Mark Hinsel, a former Republic of Ireland footballer there on the line chatting about his daughter winning bronze for Team GB during the week. Right, we are going to go to Parky Cueve because Waterford, they have opened up a bit of a gap, Taggy. Yeah, on Waterford 323, Tipperary 218. And just like the last day, on uh, Tipperary have come out of blocks and they're after looking a bit flat uh, in the third quarter. Um, Waterford outscored them 1-7 to 3 points so in the third quarter it was 2-16 to 3-21 you know Waterford really after kind of putting on the putting on the um, uh, the full throttle and uh, Tipperary uh, really struggling with the with, with the running game Seamus Cadillan is after being substituted Bubbles of the Wire which was a big call after being substituted as well after scoring 4 points in the first half um, uh, after being taken off as well so uh, Waterford really have to come into the game as I said Jamie Barron flying it there in midfield Tipperary making a lot of stupid mistakes and not able to keep up with the tempo of Waterford so far Good stuff we'll be back over to you again before the end of the game Taggy Fogarty there watching for us in Parky Cueve so as he says it is Tipperary 219 Waterford 323 at the moment so 57 minutes on the clock and we will keep you up to speed as I say as the afternoon progresses so uh, you're with us here on the Olympic show with thanks to Indeed if you're just with us you have missed uh, former Republic of Ireland footballer Mark Kinsella talking about his daughter's bronze medal with Team GB and Team Gymnastics during the week. We've also uh, had a couple of the rowers on from Ireland's own bronze medal during the week in rowing. Uh, and uh, then we also had uh, Nat Wen on the show as well, the badminton player. Uh, we are going to be back in just a few minutes and we'll be bringing you up to speed on the closing stages of this cracker in Cork. One night can help change a life. Join Focus Ireland and Board Gosh Energy for Shine a Light Night on Friday, October 15th to help raise funds for vital homelessness services. Find out more and register now at newstalk.com forward slash Focus Ireland. Sean, what's that thing going round the garden? That is my, uh, our new Husqvarna auto mower. Auto mower? Yeah, it's a robotic lawn mower from Husqvarna. Cuts the grass automatically, has GPS tracking and an app. Even works in the rain. Hmm. I just thought, why spend time cutting grass when I could spend it with the family? 
great. You can put the dinner on, so. Ah, no can do, love. I have to paint the man cave. Husqvarna Auto Mower. Never mow again. Learn more at husqvarna.ie. The new range of large capacity hot point washing machines feature smart technologies, making them tougher on stains, yet kind to your clothes. For more information, go online to paracity.ie or call in store today. The Eason Book Club on The Pat Kenny Show. This month, Eason recommended another four books for us. Did You Hear Mammy Died by Seamus O'Reilly, Such a Quiet Place by Megan Miranda, The First Day of Spring by Nancy Tucker, and our Eason Book of the Month for August is Yours Cheerfully by A.J. Pierce. London, November 1941. Things are looking up for Emmeline Lake as she takes on the challenge of becoming a young wartime advice columnist. Her relationship with boyfriend Charles is blossoming, while Emmy's best friend Bunty, still reeling from the very worst of the Blitz, is bravely looking to the future. But when the two friends meet a young woman who shows them the very real challenge